Whether you're here in person or joining us online today, thanks for taking time to be part of 360 Church. My name is Earl. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's good to have you with us on this Father's Day. Uh, the 20th century has produced a lot of really amazing inventions, but I think probably the most clever one that we've ever seen is the post-it note. Uh, there's nothing quite like a post-it note. Uh, a post-it note is amazingly simple, it's little, it is great at conveying information, but it also can be this terrifying thing, depending on what's on it. Uh, messages like, where were you? And uh, pick up the kids at five, and you're reading it at six. <laughs> so terrifying. Now, this is my personal stress-inducing favorite, we need to talk. When you see that, uh, I don't know about you, but my heart rate just goes up. I, just, I don't do well with stress situations. I find myself thinking, oh man, what have I done? Uh, now you can send the same message by a text, but a post-it note has no reply button. A text is a conversation, a post-it note is a declaration, and uh, you are simply the recipient of a one-way monologue type of, of message. Uh, it, the problem is there are really times in life when that's exactly the kind of message you need. Uh, there's times in life when you just need a good talking to. You need someone to take you aside and tell you the truth about what your life is like. And uh, we've been looking at some aspects of that uh, this month in a series we call Why Can't We All Just Get Along? And it deals with what Jesus taught us about relationships in a faith community. Uh, in Matthew chapter 18, it's about how to give people the post-it notes of life. Now, the chapter can be thought of in kind of two pieces. Uh, the first part of it is full of warnings. Uh, it has to do with millstones being hung around your neck. It has to do with the hell of fire. And it's basically the immune system of the faith community. It says, danger, Will Robinson. Don't do this. Stay away from that. Don't harm people. Don't sin against those who are out on the margins. Because if you do, there are just terrible consequences that come with that. But like the immune system in your body, which doesn't always work, uh, sometimes the immune system in a spiritual body doesn't always work the way it should either. I have a friend, Joel, who has this terrible allergy to peanuts, and if he even smells them, his body tells them that something is wrong by trying to choke him with a swollen throat. and forgiveness and you know put together they make a lot of sense mm -hmm. because I, I get a warning and then if I'm not able or I'm unwilling to follow the warning Jesus has made a way for me if you will to hit the airbag instead mm -hmm. of to hit the dashboard yeah. mm -hmm. and in the seam between these two halves almost unnoticed there is this tiny little parable about sheep it starts in verse 12 of Matthew 18 and it says this what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep, which was about an average flock in those days, and one of them has gone astray, does not he leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the other 99 that never went astray. This small picture is, in a way, a message to us about how the two halves of the chapter fit together, almost as if to say, when someone in the community goes astray, we all take on the identity of the shepherd who pursues this wandering person, not with the attempt to destroy them, but to bring them back, to regain them into the fellowship that they're risking a loss of because of the kind of conduct that they're involved in in their life. Now, in a sense, in our culture, this is unthinkable because we're talking about judging other people. And if we could make a bumper sticker that represented the cultural feel of America right now with one phrase, it would probably be, don't judge me. Mm -hmm. As I read this passage, what I see in it is I don't have a right to judge anybody, mm -hmm. but sometimes I have a duty to be involved in that in people in the community. So when it comes time to put up the post-it notes of life, we need to talk. How does that happen? 
I have a friend who uh, is in a, a, serves in an African nation. He's a citizen there. And in his tradition, if somebody in their faith community, which happens to be part of our international network, is found to be a wanderer, a sheep who's drifted off the path, uh, what they do is identify this person, bring them to church in front of everyone, pull them to the front of the church in full view of the entire group, and the pastor personally castigates the person for their sins in excruciating detail in full view of the entire family and of the entire church until the individual falls to the floor writhing under the burden of incipient repentance and finally breaks through and comes out the other side and pleads for forgiveness which the pastor finally extends in front of the congregation. Who's for that here? <laughs> okay, not so much, huh? Well, <laughs> It's important to distinguish between what's culturally comfortable for us and what we're actually instructed to do. And so Jesus has given us these really practical ways of making sure the airbag inflates. And uh, they begin in verse 15 in Matthew 18. You'll find that on the program that you were given when you entered today and also on the slide behind me. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Now, sometime back when we lived in another state, Jan and I owned a very large dog. Uh, not a Berkeley dog. This dog would not be allowed in Berkeley. It would be illegal. Uh, extremely large, 75 pounds, a purebred collie, a beautiful dog. If you're a dog lover, this, this, it, the, the chain of nature goes like elephant, horse, this dog. I mean, it was, it was enormous. And uh, it, uh, as you know, purebred dogs are odd. Can I just say, can we just say it out loud? They're warped really by too much ingreeding and so the dog had two issues the one issue was narcissism the dog was a narcissist if i would hug jan the dog would attempt to squeeze in between us because it could not bear the thought of not being the complete object of all of the attention available in the entire known universe and this every single day he never grew tired of trying to be the center of everything. So that was problem number one. The other problem was he really liked running away. And whenever he ran away, he would pull the stake on the chain up out of the ground in the backyard and drag it to his favorite destination, which was McDonald's. <laughs> because the teenagers in our town who hung out there, because in our little town there was no place else to be, uh, there was no mall or anything like that, uh, whenever our dog would show up, the teenagers would uh, feed him Big Macs. <laughs> And Gabriel loved a Big Mac. <laughs> we would have to go to McDonald's. In fact, eventually we learned that's the only place we needed to go. We didn't have to call the police or put out a search grid or anything like that. He would be there with the kids feeding him Big Macs. And sometimes it was, do you want fries with that? Uh, and what Gabriel taught us was, as long as there are Big Macs, there will be strays. <laughs> there are always going to be situations and always going to be people. And sometimes those people can be us. In which case, the Big Mac seems better than staying at home. And even though there's this really sturdy, important, necessary, helpful, life-giving chain and stake in the ground, <laughs> just for a fleeting moment of foolishness, it can seem better to pull that thing up out of the dirt and run across town and let someone feed me something I shouldn't be eating. <laughs> and that's when it's posted note time. Now there's disagreement here about whether this verse refers to a sin against you personally or whether it refers to people who wander away in some more general sense that you have observed. Given some of the other passages in the New Testament about reaching out to people and restoring them, I kind of lean towards the latter a little bit. But we do know for sure a couple things it doesn't mean. It does not refer to a general lifestyle disagreements. Like, I don't like your politics. Or you should be driving a Prius. or mm -hmm. You have so little fashion sense, even Goodwill wouldn't take your clothes. <laughs> or, oh, well, you split infinitives, or some sort of late night dorm room, you know, he said, she said kind of thing. Not, not about that, not about that. It's also not a double O license to kill to go out and judge everybody in the world. This passage is about what happens in our own house. And you know, sometimes uh, people who name the name of Jesus spend all of their time judging everybody on the outside for this and that and the other thing while our own filthy laundry piles up in the hamper and it stinks to everybody but us. So this is about how to do the laundry in our house, how to take care of, uh, of our own. And what I love is the fact that uh, 
the person who wanders away here is still called my brother. So if your brother sins against you, the fact that uh, the person's out there at McDonald's having the Big Mac does not change them into a monster or an enemy, or most importantly, maybe it doesn't change them into nothing to me. But we're all still part of the family, and maybe that family is never more important than when that Big Mac is smelling so good. Because it's that family sense that's the only hope we're ever going to get back together. When that sheep wanders off, while I never have the right to judge anybody, this is one of those times where I have the duty to be involved in this form of evaluation. And without waiting for the person to come to their senses, like in the parable of the prodigal son, or waiting for them to come back to apologize to me, it now becomes my duty to go to them and tell them what the offense is. The, the word there is actually stronger than that. It means show them. In other words, unpack it for them so they can understand how it looks to me. The hope being that the, the wandering sheep, the, the person eating the Big Mac, will hear my explanation and get kind of get inside it themselves and say, oh, oh, oh. You see how different that is from going and just making an announcement about what someone else's sin is? <laughs> Which is, I don't know, not you, but I find that so appealing. <laughs> just to go to, just say, Brother Ned, you are just, a, yeah. you are a lying low down rat. <laughs> and we all know it. When are you going to get right with God? I've heard whole sermons like that, haven't you? This, that's, that's not what's happening here. What Jesus is saying is, you've got to help them understand, man, because part of the reason they may be over at McDonald's is because they just, they're not getting it. They don't understand the implications of what they're doing or they're, they, they've gotten confused in some way. And as a result of this, uh, I'm able to, to allow this person a moment of discovery where they get to recover their own life before anybody else gets involved. This is why uh, Jesus instructs really clearly here that this has to happen in private. Now, sometimes what I've seen happen in the past is when a person feels that they're offended or they see Brother Ned, who I always pick on. I think I may have Ned Flanders in my mind. I, I'm not sure. Uh, what happens is uh, we go to other people in the church and say, you know, we need to pray. <laughs> Brother Ned is, uh, he's in sin. <laughs> he's wolfing down one Big Mac after another. <laughs> Uh, this isn't gossip, you understand? We just need to pray. It's a prayer request. You have a prayer chain in this church. Do you remember those before cell phones? Well, 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 I think maybe I'll just put it on the church Facebook group. <laughs> Low dog, lion, rat. And we all need to be praying for his soul because he's just insane. And we even bang Max all the time. And of course, what this does is this blows Brother Ned out of the water because now we've gone public with something that we're explicitly told has to be handled in private. He now has no chance to back up because when you've involved the person's pride on top of the offense, you've now created two barriers and those Big Macs are smelling better than ever. And what Ned starts thinking is if they're going to treat me this way at, at, at your place, man, I'm going to pull up stakes and live over there at McDonald's because they'll give me Big Macs no matter what I'm doing. I'm with the Big Mac people. You guys leave me alone. You're, you're treating me like I'm some kind of outsider, like I am not your brother. Best case scenario, the person has the opportunity to see what they've done, and you have regained your family member. Doesn't that feel good? I remember one day uh, working in an institution, uh, one of my teammates came in, and you know you're in trouble when they close the door behind them. And she closed the door and sat in this chair without saying, this is all unannounced. That's the other way you know you're in trouble in a meeting. Uh, and uh, looked at me and explained that uh, I had made a decision with this team I was working with in another setting. And in this decision, I had communicated some things to the other members of, a te of the team, which created in her mind the notion that I did not respect her. It had to do with the responsibility that I did not offer her the opportunity to become involved in. And when she said this to me, I just, have you ever had an arrow in the heart moment? Because you feel so responsible for the people that you work with and to, to hurt them or offend them is, I guess if your agenda has, an, has a bottom, that's, that's where that is. And I felt this arrow, you can hear arrows coming. 
and it just hit me right there. And uh, I cried because I, I honestly had hurt this person who was not sensitive. I hate it when it goes that way. Who was not, had no issues, had no access to grind. This is just straight up, it's me, my bad, 100%. And uh, I said, I am so sorry about this. That I would never uh, intend this. And the reason is because I do respect you completely. It just never occurred to me that you would be interested in that responsibility. And she believed me because it was true. And so we had a kind of both a little sniffling moment there. And uh, she regained her brother. And our team came back together and we, we just went on. But the only reason it worked that way, it, it wasn't because of me, it was because the door was closed. Now you do that in front of a bunch of people or in a Facebook prayer request as a status update, what are the odds that that relationship's going to work out? It never is. She treated me like her brother who was in error, not like her enemy or like nothing or just putting it on the long checklist of ways you've offended me and never saying anything about it. I've seen marriages like that, where there's big piles of laundry that's never been done. Because no one ever closed the door and said, you know, when you talk about me that way in public, I feel disrespected. What you think you're doing when you're making fun of me when we're with people, what you're really doing is putting me down and it makes me feel like trash and it embarrasses me in front of other people and uh, it's driving a wedge between us. That's, that's family talk, that's, that's brother talk, that's not, that's not enemy talk. Behind that closed door, we're so powerful and in public, so weak. Worst case scenario, the person doesn't want to hear it. Jesus says in verse 16, if he does not listen, the, the original language there is actually stronger. It means if he refuses to listen. This is not inadvertent. This is deliberate. If he refuses to listen, take two or three others along with you that every charge or a, a better way of saying it would be all the facts may be established by the evidence of those two or three witnesses. Uh, Jesus plainly drawing from the teaching in Deuteronomy 19 about one witness not being sufficient to establish the facts of the case, <clears throat> if I've been turned away, my shepherd responsibilities remain, as would yours. Two or three trustworthy people can be brought into the situation. Uh, the facts can be explained. And then in private, again, the wandering person is, you, you go to McDonald's and find them, and again in private, uh, talk to them. The wonderful thing about this is, in case the original accuser is wrong, those two or three people can correct you. Because it could be my misunderstanding and two or three people with me who are also witnesses to the conversation, so we know what has been said, could come back to me and say, you know, Earl, um, I think you're really misunderstanding what's gone on here. This wasn't a real offense, it was this other thing. Or the language you're using for it is way too severe. It's, it's actually, uh, this other way is more effective in interpreting it. And so this is a fire break. And for the person who is the wanderer, it gives them a little bit of what we might call due process today so that there are off ramps before everything goes public and crazy and, and gets uh, out of control. So these witnesses have uh, a great deal of, of influence and uh, the ability uh, to make sure that things remain fair uh, and impartial and that that Wanderer remains my brother, not my enemy. So the witnesses aren't just to call down the wanderer. The witnesses are also for accountability for the person who started the whole process. Best case, the wanderer says, Big Macs are no good for me. Uh, you're right. I apologize. I'm coming back. And everything is restored. Worst case leads to verse 17. If he refuses, there's refusal again, to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let it be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now we're two or three refusals into the process. We go to the leadership of the church. Now this is ironic. For one thing, there is no church when these words are said. 
The 12 are still in boot camp. And so the other irony here is that the standard of someone who is going to be treated as an outsider is a tax collector, and the person who records these words is a man named Matthew, who is himself. <laughs> yeah, that's gotta hurt. That's that's an ouch moment. You can just you know you can just see him go like the cringe as he's writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I can't believe you said that about me. That's so oh, I, 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 what, what is that all about? Now, most likely the people who hear this teaching, uh, because it's in a, a, a Jewish context, are thinking. We're going to have to go to the elders of the local synagogue because the local synagogue would be the equivalent of the county court system that we have today. Uh, the synagogues doubled as courthouses, and so they're thinking if someone has uh, wandered away, they're outside of the perimeter of what God knows and says is life-giving for us, we're going to go to the place where that kind of thing can be called into account in public, and so that's going to be a, a kind of a, a, a synagogue setting. Uh, that means that at some point, Someone in leadership pulls in the person who is the wanderer with the witnesses and everyone else. They sit down with the person if they're willing to do this, lay the whole situation out. And it sounds very heavy duty on the individual who is at McDonald's with the Big Macs, but it really has the function of offering an additional protection to that person before they face consequences. The consequences of not doing this are way worse not only for the individual, uh, but for the group. Uh, long ago in another place, uh, we led a church and in our first few weeks there, we discovered that upon our arrival, that nothing had ever been dealt with for years, mm -hmm. nothing. Right. Uh, and in the first year or two of us being there, uh, I had to prosecute what I would call 10 felony level <laughs> disciplinary cases. We had so many Big Macs that we actually had to divide them into felony and misdemeanor. And the pastors just handled the misdemeanors on a day-to-day -day basis because there were so, so many of them, we couldn't figure another way to do it. The felonies, that's when we pulled in the board of directors and we pulled in sometimes the state. We pulled in uh, the officials from our network. We were doing about one a month. And the truth is this stuff was eating us up from the inside because our laundry had been allowed to remain in the hamper unwashed for so long, we were, we were a festering, moldering shill of a place that was going to collapse upon itself <clears throat> because we didn't have enough righteousness to put together a little pile of it. Meanwhile, people wanted me to stand in the pulpit and judge the world. Being against sin, to inveigh against uh, sin and profligate living and promiscuity and all of the other things, while our own house was rotting from underneath. These things can't wait, and they have to be handled when they're in place. If it goes to the public level, that individual then becomes like a Gentile and a tax collector, a Gentile being an outsider to our community, a tax collector being someone who was part of us but betrayed us the way tax collectors did in the first century by serving the Romans, which means to say their relationship with us is severed. We have to be the kind of faith community that has the sort of qualities that the loss of relationship with us would actually be thought of as a penalty rather than just an opportunity to change where I worship. You see the difference that makes? We have to be a place that has enough love, enough grace, enough fun, enough joy, enough relationship connection, enough fruitfulness in our community, enough enduring fruit, enough value, that if that were lost, that would be an ouch moment for someone that it would be a tragedy for someone. Have you ever been someplace in a community and you just observe their lifestyle and you just you have to wonder, would, if I lost this, would it, would it really matter? Maybe the reason there's so little discipline is because there's so little value in some of the communities that we have. We have to be that kind of place. That's the gold standard. Are we the sort of community that someone would just hate to not be part of anymore?
Maybe the strongest example of this taking place in the New Testament context took place in the first century in the Greek city of Corinth. It's written about by the Apostle Paul in both of the existing letters of his that we have. And the situation was one uh, in which uh, in each worship service, a man was showing up uh, in a couple relationship with his stepmother. The apostle is so shocked about this that he writes to the Corinthian church and basically it's hard to overstate his outrage. It's like, how can you guys let this happen? And you can see what the Corinthians are thinking. Hey, this is Corinth. This is the Las Vegas of the ancient world. This is so much what we're doing. What this couple represents is so much better than the way the average person in the city is living. This is a step forward, you see. And they're sincere. <laughs> so it's all good as far as we're concerned. And Paul's outrage is just, the court comes out of the bottle. I mean, you can almost hear him shouting when you're reading these passages. He's saying, this is just like McDonald's, this is Big Mac territory. We're supposed to be on the outside of that, not involved in it, not replicating it. And he tells them that essentially what he's implying is, is the fact that, that you're sincere in your belief and it matches the standards of your culture doesn't mean that it fits within the community of Christ. And he says, I, I prayed about this, thought about this, and when my spirit is there and when you're together, uh, what I want you to do with this man, it's interesting the woman's not mentioned, just the man, what I want you to do with this man is turn him over to Satan. Not to destroy him, but so that he can get what he wants. Do you know what happens to you if you eat nothing but Big Macs? I mean, imagine if we could give you a pill that would advance the date of your heart attack to this afternoon. Would you change your diet? That's exactly the reasoning here. The relationship with the community is severed. The man is excommunicated. But when he writes to them in his next letter, he says, all right, that's enough. If we do this anymore to this guy, he's going to break under the pain of it. What I want you to do is go to him now and restore him and welcome him back. He's probably had enough Big Macs to realize that that's not really the place where he wants to live and you have gained your brother. Jesus describes that process this way. Verse 18, he says, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among you. In other words, when you're in the middle of this situation and you come together as a faith community, instead of doing a prayer request at the beginning, the praying happens at the end. We pray, we recognize what's going on, we release this person from the community, and Jesus is never more with us than at that moment. Do you ever get asked why uh, people who follow Jesus do so much bad stuff? I get asked that a lot. <laughs> you know, or when people find out I'm a pastor, I get the eye roll, which is the, the nonverbal way of saying the same thing sometimes. And you know, the, the, the list of our offenses, it's almost as if it all comes out of the same book. Uh, there's like eight or ten things that everybody will ask you about, and they're, they're true. That's the thing that's really unsettling about them. How can <clears throat> we be what we claim we're supposed to be? We're not the Big Mac kind of folks. We're about love and grace and mercy. And, 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 and all that be true. Uh, well, I wonder this. What if the first Christian who ever uttered a derogatory remark about a Muslim had been confronted by another Christian who said, that's not how we talk? Would we have had a crusade? What if the first Christian who ever uttered a racial epithet about an African American in the South mm -hmm had had a brother come to him in the yes, South yes. and said, that's not how we think about each other around here, brother. That's Big Mac territory. Yeah. Would we have so many of us resisted civil rights legislation? Mm -hmm. What if the first person who had ever uh, uttered a gay bashing remark had pounded down someone, had criticized, had had a, another brother come to them and say, hey, we don't talk about anybody like that. Would we have the kind of hate in our communities that we have?
I think a disciplined church would be a holy church mm -hmm. and would take an awful lot of the social offenses we've committed off the historical mm -hmm. record. Who knows where we would yeah. be now yeah. if someone had said that sheep is wandering and my duty here is to be the shepherd. Mm -hmm. right. We need to talk. Mm -hmm. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being the great shepherd and guardian of our souls. And we're standing here today in uh, full recognition of our own faults and failings and of our need for your grace and mercy to cover all of those things. Lord, our frame is dust, and you know that. If you would count our iniquities, who among us could stand? We thank you, Lord, for uh, having a way of reaching out to people who are just really struggling and helping them find a way back. <coughs> and we ask you for the grace to... Uh, to do that and the love to do those things in the right way uh, in those seasons of life. Thank you that there's someone we can turn to who makes that kind of love and grace available. We honor you and praise you for that. We thank you in Jesus' name.